Thank you, Stan. Uh, Benny Pizer, am I pronouncing that right, last name? Uh, is a social anthropologist at Liverpool John Moores University in the United uh, Kingdom. His research focuses on the effects of environmental change and catastrophic events on contemporary thought and societal evolution. Pizer is a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and a member of Space Guard UK. That sounds really cool. What is that? Can we explain that? What that is? What? We are trying to stop asteroids. Stop asteroids. Okay. <coughs> Do they, do they issue a helmet for that? Or? Uh, he's the editor of CCNet, an electronic science and science policy network with more than 6,000 subscribers from around the world. It is in this capacity that a 10 kilometer wide asteroid, minor planet Pizer, was named in his honor by the International Astronomical Union. That's cool, too. Uh, Pizer is a member of the editorial board of Energy and Environment and a scientific advisor to the Lifeboat Foundation. Please welcome Benny Pizer. Uh, thank you very much. I've also got a PowerPoint presentation, but I've decided uh, against using it. So I'm just trying to uh, present my thoughts in the old-fashioned way. The title of my talk is Societal Evolution and the Rise of a Climate-Proof Planetary Civilization. But I think a better title would be What if Al Gore is right? What, let's imagine that Al Gore actually had accepted the invitation to attend this conference. I understand he was invited, but uh, he said, sorry, I haven't got any time. But let's say... Uh, he would have accepted the invitation, he would have actually attended uh, some of the talks, and after the conference, he would have said, okay, very interesting talks, but what if I'm right and you are wrong? And in order for us to understand uh, the whole item of global warming, we, I think, need to understand the cultural and social background to this fear of climate change. Um, and that is part of my talk, the talk about what if CO2 emissions will continue to rise as they are going to in the next 30, 40 years, what if the um, temperature rise is going to continue, which is likely to happen. What if the climate alarm and the anxiety is going to swell? Um, or what if the Russian scientists uh, who claim that we're facing a little ice age in the near future are right? These are the questions on many people's minds. And um, a lot of the kind of responses from the skeptical camp are, I come to these different responses, are apparently not um, reassuring the public, neither reassuring the politicians. So the outline of my talk is that I will briefly assess the contemporary apocalyptic fears of um, doom, and disaster. I will also mention our historical baggage of um, previous societies having to cope with uh, disastrous uh, climate, like crop failure, starvation, uh, even civilizations crumbling under the onslaught of natural disasters. And I will point out the differences between ag agricultural agrarian societies handling climate change and uh, industrial societies or hyper-complex societies and growing resilience to uh, natural disasters. And finally, I will present my own view on this whole uh, contentious issue, namely the vision of a hyper-technology society that actually can produce and develop technologies that can help us to deal with significant climate change, whatever the causes. 
of them. But because, as has been said many times, climate change has always happened and will always happen. And whether it is man-made or not, we will have to face the prospect of significant changes sometime in the future, and we will have to be prepared. So let's start with the underlying fear that drives much of the global warming policies, including research policies. Um, you, you're all aware of the headlines in recent years and the claims that uh, we're facing the biggest threat uh, mankind has faced in recent uh, history, that uh, we're facing a major upheaval, disaster, uh, social unrest as a result. We should not underestimate the worries and anxiety and concerns these um, media headlines have and, and, and television programs have created. We have to take these concerns seriously and I'm not entirely sure that by simply uh, ridiculing them or minimizing them we can actually respond in a effective way. The reason why people are concerned about climate change is because um, we know from history that civilizations have experienced significant problems with uh, climatic change, including mega droughts, uh, crop failure, uh, mass starvation, and up until fairly recently, um, up until the mid end 20th century, that was a recurrent problem of many developing countries. And we know that uh, the main reason for these uh, climate or weather-driven uh, st stress events um, have to do with climate variability, fluctuating climates, and we know from our European history and other parts of the world that uh, in times of climate stress, societies find it, particularly agrarian societies, find it increasingly difficult to cope and to feed their populations. So the reason for the anxiety is that we have had a very tough history with the climate. Uh, just think about the uh, Little Ice Age where we have recurrent um, periods of mass starvation and population crashes in Europe where whole harvests are destroyed by, by uh, extreme weather events, and um, whole areas uh, of Europe uh, were affected. So the images of um, a burning planet or the images of an ice age, these images which we, which we can um, observe on an almost daily basis in the mass media in particular, fed by research, um, trigger the anxieties we have to respond to. Now, the, as I said, the response um, by the climate skeptics has been to either argue that whatever climate change is happening is mainly natural and that therefore it is unstoppable. That, that's basically uh, Fred Singer's um, point that, well, yeah, it is changing, climate is changing, but there is nothing we can do about it. So we, we better be prepared. Um, that is fine as long as people like um, Patrick Michaels or uh, Richard um, Lindzen are right in, by claiming that the warming will be moderate and in the next 100 years will be gradual and mod moderate and perhaps not more than 1 or 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius. The problem is that Al Gore would say, yeah, okay, if it's just 1 degree, I would agree, but what if it's 6 or more? And that is always the argument by the alarmists that they argue you cannot rule out the, the possibility or the probability that it's much worse than we think. So although there is a likelihood that it is, that the whole uh, 
warming trend might be moderate and, and small, there is a likelihood, we cannot quantify it perhaps statistically, uh, that it is much more se uh, serious. So people will be uneasy about these kind of future predictions. Now, people like Bjorn Long, uh, Lomborg or Indor Gaklani, who um, basically say, well, okay, let's accept these scenarios by the IPCC, um, they argue that even if the climate warms by four degrees Celsius, the economic growth will make the world much more resilient, even to significant warming. Um, all arguments which I think are very valid, I'm not entirely sure that they counter the underlying anxieties. And the anxieties, as I said, they don't result from the prospect of warming. The anxieties result from the from the worst case disaster scenarios, that it's not just the warming that is gradually uh, uh, rising over a hundred year period, it's the kind of disaster, the kind of tipping point image, uh, images you often hear about, the kind of um, uh, unstoppable uh, runaway greenhouse effect where something goes out of control, completely out of control. That's the underlying fear. And although it is, a, as I said, a statistically speaking, highly unlikely, minute chance, no one can rule it out. And that's good enough for an alarmist. If you can rule it, can't rule it out, it doesn't matter how small the <laughs> statistical risk, it's a possibility. And I argue that we need to respond to this alarmist vision of the future in a responsible way. As I said, part of the paleoclimatic research in recent years ha has come up with suggestions that past societies have been hit quite uh, hard by uh, ancient climate change events um, sometimes perhaps even abrupt events. No one knows exactly what may have caused these abrupt events, but there are claims that, for instance, the ancient Maya or the ancient Mesopotamian civilizations were um, s seriously affected by climate change and that some of their um, high cultures crumbled under the onslaught of climate change. Now, with the Industrial Revolution, we see a complete and, and total change um, to the way societies uh, develop, the speed uh, of, of, of growth and development, and also the resilience uh, to cope with uh, climatic stress. Uh, just look at the US. The US is, is, is a perfect example. I understand that on an average year, 60% of the, of the US uh, land mass is uh, uh, drought uh, stressed. So a lot of uh, the US uh, on a, in an average normal year, a lot of states uh, have drought conditions or what is called drought conditions. And, um, and, and sometimes that is even a significant uh, uh, drought years, but that doesn't mean that the population suddenly uh, faces starvation because the US can now ride out these kind of stresses previous generations would have uh, had difficulties coping with. That has to do with uh, better management of agriculture, that has to do with a uh, much, much more efficient uh, uh, crops, um, and it has to do uh, with the fact that you can simply um, transport food and food is transported all the time uh, from state to state. So with the growth uh, that comes uh, as a result of the Industrial Revolution comes this huge energy uh, consumption, growth in energy, and I already mentioned that as far as all expectations and all estimates are concerned, um, most energy experts predict that energy consumption will grow by about 50% in the next 40 years. Some people 
argue that if lifestyles in India and China will approach European standards, that energy consumption might even double or triple in the next 40 years. So if you imagine 1.5 billion Chinese or 1.5 billion Indians uh, in, mid, uh, in the mid 21st century with the expectation of European living standards, then you have to uh, reckon with a tripling of energy need globally from today's energy needs. And all energy experts are pretty sure that regardless what uh, innovations will come online in the next 10 or 20 years, by 2050, the majority of this energy consumption will still be fed by fossil fuels. And consequently, we have to, uh, we have to envisage uh, a world, at least for the next 30, 40 years, where CO2 emissions will rise significantly. And uh, consequently, we have to um, envisage the whole anxiety about global warming to continue. That's a at least a very likely scenario. And at the, at the, at the uh, other side of the debate is the realization of increasing numbers of governments that it's much more difficult to reduce CO2 emissions than anyone had anticipated, at least the, pe the, the kind of uh, environmentally informed governments who really thought that they could basically c uh, control the economy and, 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 and change the economy in such a way that CO2 emissions would be significantly reduced. Even the Europeans find it increasingly difficult to do anything about uh, CO2 emissions. Um, and, and in every single country in Europe, basically, CO emissions continue to rise. In addition to the rising uh, energy consumption uh, due to economic growth and, and, and rising living standards, you have the population increase. We're uh, expecting about 9 to 10 billion people by the year 2050, which obviously uh, will add to the energy needs. Now, that I think most people would accept. What many people don't realize is that with industrialization and technology, uh, societies actually become uh, less vulnerable to natural disasters and environmental stress. And there is very good data. Uh, Indira Klani uh, published a paper recently showing that uh, weather-related natural disasters and uh, deaths and, and, uh, um, um, uh, around the world, not just in the US, have actually declined in the last 50 years, which is a, a, a clear indication that societies uh, are, are becoming more resilient to natural disasters as they develop and as they grow and as, as their societies become uh, more developed. Other studies have shown that there is a clear relationship between um, GDP and, uh, and openness, political openness, democracy and natural disasters. So again, uh, societies that are uh, politically more advanced than others, uh, that are open um, in, in uh, contrast to closed societies, seem to be better able to cope with natural disasters. And of course, um, if you look at the disasters um, resulting in 10 million or more deaths in the last few hundred years, you will find that most of the big disasters uh, the world faced were either pandemics, genocide, or wars. Uh, the big uh, disasters are not related to climate change. So, coming back to the question, what if the alarmists are right, and what if the skeptics are wrong? Um, what if we are really facing this prospect of a dramatic rise in temperature? Um, how are we going to cope with such a scenario given that th we are unlikely to reduce CO2 emissions in the near future? And so more and more researchers have started to look into um, what is generally called geoengineering. Um, and, uh, 
just a few weeks ago, a new pub, a paper was published showing that from a purely economic point of view, geoengineering is actually, it's so cheap, or some of the, some of the schemes, that uh, you can't even quantify the kind of cost that uh, compared to the kind of stern review uh, scenarios where you have to change the whole economy. But nevertheless, the geoengineering uh, schemes are controversial because of the unintended consequences that come with it and with this uh, added anxiety of playing God. And also, some countries will actually benefit from global warming, even significant global warming. And if you start tinkering with the climate and you're stopping global warming, they might actually feel that they are bereft of the benefits. A country like Canada or, 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 or Russia might actually get something out of global warming. And if you started to say, we don't want that to happen, uh, and, and vice versa, other countries obviously uh, are much more affected. So there are political problems and social problems, but at the end of the day, I would argue that geoengineering will become a, a, a serious option as an insurance policy. Again, a highly unlikely policy that might never be used, at least in the near future. But let's face it, sooner or later, we might face some severe climate change. Might happen in 200 years or 500 years. Sooner or later, uh, our civilization will develop the technologies to actually control uh, regional climates and global climate. And um, I'm all in favor of it for the pure reason that although we might never need it, not in the near future, it will give us the insurance and the reassurance to tell the alarmists that even if their worst case scenarios were ever to come true, we are not left without a solution. And therefore, if you look at the long-term future, unless we blow our civilization up by our own folly, which is anyhow the biggest risk we face, it's not the climate, it's not asteroids, it's homo sapiens, it's our own follies. Um, but let's speculate and let's envisage that we can go through the 21st century without blowing up our own cultures and civilizations, then in all likelihood, we will have technologies that will make mega droughts uh, and starvation a thing of the past, um, that will have desalination plants basically at every coast, that where we can uh, uh, green the deserts, uh, artificially and where energy will eventually uh, be um, solar based and uh, fossil fuels will become a thing of the past. I personally think this is a much more realistic scenario of the future than the uh, disaster scenarios and I'm confident that this very scenario will provide the reassurance and let me finish on one note. Uh, I think a week ago or so, a new paper was published um, by a team of researchers that showed that the more people actually know about climate change science, the more they are aware of the research, the less they are concerned about global warming. And people were speculating what that could be, what, why people are uh, less concerned the more they know, which I find absolutely reassuring because that's how it should be. <laughs> um, one reason given in the paper for why people are less concerned about uh, global warming is that they are also aware of the technological options that we have in the future. Mind you, when I argue, uh, make a case for geoengineering, um, let me remind you that everyone nowadays wants to uh, engineer the climate, okay? Governments want to capture and uh, store uh, CO2, sequester CO2. That's a way of geoengineering. 
even planting trees to, to, to capture CO2 uh, is a way of geoengineering, of course on a different level, but everyone now accepts that the solution to our energy problems and long-term climate problems are technological solutions. And therefore, people who are less concerned are also the people who know that in the long term, we are pretty sure to find the technological solutions to our current problems, how, regardless how big or how small they are. Thank you very much.